This is a terrific opportunity for me to talk with you all. I mean, a talk like this I give around the country, mostly to schools of architecture and also conferences on service learning and community engagement, but to talk to people in Cincinnati, I, I have to be truthful. <laughs> because, you know, you can get away with things in certain, certain environments, maybe stretch the truth a little bit, but I'm assuming you all know over the Rhine pretty well. So, I want to introduce John Blake for a minute. Uh, John Blake is the Community Projects Coordinator at the Center for Community Engagement and also since 2006 has been running our design build program that, and we'll show you some slides of that in a second. Um, I want to talk about what we call the Over the Rhine uh, Residency Program, but I want to talk about it within four narratives. Um, share with you in a sense, the various kind of narratives that I have seen circulating around Cincinnati that tries to explain a place like Over the Rhine. Um, the question I think that was shared with you is like, you know, how do you know Over the Rhine? Uh, the other question is, what is the story that you find yourself telling most about Over the Rhine? And so I want to kind of push that a little bit. This is a little bit about myself. Um, I went looking for Over the Rhine in 1981. After a few years of teaching, I got stabilized in that sense, and I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, go find a place like Over the Rhine. I was looking for controversy. I thought there would be controversy in Over the Rhine. And uh, in 96, we, uh, John Blake and I, we started the design build program. Um, we would actually commute to Over the Rhine three days a week. Studio meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one to five commute, leave the building at one from Miami, try and get three good hours of work, drive back. It's the stupidest way to try and do design build work, you know. But anyway, um, but students in that period of the late 90s said, Tom, we're learning an awful lot about design build, but we're just not learning enough about the community because we're trying to be so efficient and doing stuff in buildings. And so that's what led to the idea of a center that we established in 2002. Lots of people, it's just not me, but, but community blessing as well. And then in 2006, just four short years after the establishment of the center, we were able to start the residency program. Now this is the story. 1950, 30,000 people, mostly white. And 2010, about 7,000 people, let's say mostly black. I think that it's around 75, 25 African American to white population. Of course, uh, the median income is still pretty low. 2001, the racial unrest and police community relations. The question is, how do you tell that story? It's not a story that only happened in Over the Rhine, of course. It happened in lots of cities in the United States, and I think we probably all know that. But let's go right into these narratives of explanation. Here's the first one. The narrative of poverty. And these are the sort of terms that you have with this. Crime, drugs, black-on-black -black violence, homelessness. It's a dangerous urban wasteland. You've probably heard it. If you're going to drive through over the Rhine, make sure you roll up your windows and lock your doors. No one in their right mind would actually ever really live there. You know, that kind of thing. And that kind of hangs in there. You know, that kind of hangs in. It's still, uh, there's a student of ours that uh, did some work in a, a restaurant as a greeter right at the northeast corner of Washington Park and got a call from a person who was standing on the steps of Music Hall asking is it safe to walk over there. Now, I'm not trying to say that this is a, um, that that's a, a bad, I mean, it's, it's a very real thing. A lot of people have real fear, and then uh, they're perhaps maybe too, too much captured by this particular narrative. This is the other narrative that's starting to evolve now, and think of this narrative, it's pretty interesting. The urban renaissance this is the term you start hearing more now. New upscale development, condos, restaurants, boutiques, you know, there's a historic preservation discourse that's underneath it all. That's kind of good. You hear terms like economic mix, mixed income neighborhoods, mixed income development. 
And this is all fine. I mean, and just that, uh, but what I want to point out to you is that these two narratives, one being poverty, there's like no organization, there's nothing going on there. It's just a wasteland. There's, you know, it's just dark and dank and, you know, and drugs and mayhem. And then there's this one, the urban renaissance. But both of those, I would say, argue with you, miss a third narrative that exists. And that's perhaps represented by the Over the Rhine People's Movement. Now, the People's Movement has been in existence for 40 plus years. Um, they organize around affordable housing development. They try and address homelessness. There's popular education at the Peasley Neighborhood Center. Uh, obviously, with the Coalition for the Homeless and the Drop-In Center, you know, there's, there's entities like that. Over the Rhine Community Housing, the Contact Center, um, and on and on. There's all kinds of things that happen. And when you begin to, I mean, the question is, did you know about this effort? For 40 plus years, a group of organizations and a group of people have loosely aligned under this banner called the Over the Rhine People's Movement. The question is, if you haven't heard of that, why not? And it's not like you have to agree with it, but I find it interesting that both of the first two narratives basically submerge this one. In the first one, no one's there. In the second one, you have a renaissance. Now think about this term renaissance. What do you think? Michelangelo, Florence, Rome. And what happened before the renaissance? We call that period the Dark Ages, where nothing happened, except maybe that plague in 1345, right? So uh, it's a very, I'm not, I'm not implying intent on the part of anybody, but it's an interesting term. Like it, both of these terms, the poverty narrative and the, this narrative basically kind of submerge the people's movement that have been there. They, people in the people's movement would tell you that they have been trying to build life when a lot of people left. Remember, all those people left. A lot of people left. The area turned over racially. It became a very poor space. A lot of people there did try and address deep social need by building organizations to address that need. And our point is we try and bring Miami students to that environment to kind of wrestle with these three narratives. Are they aware of them? This is our first cohort in 2006. And what is the residency program? Well, the students actually live full time down there. They take all their courses down there. Um, we began what we call the Atelier Program. This is something that John started in um, 2010. This is a program that we have in the spring. The fall residency program is the full-fledged program. I'll explain a little bit more deeply. But first, something about the Atelier. This is a situation where Miami architecture students live in the community. They work at CR Architecture and Design, but they don't work for that firm, but they take benefit of that firm and its culture and the meetings and all the expertise that that firm brings to bear. But the students bring in a project. John is with them the entire time. So the students, faculty, and people at CR are working on a project that is for the benefit of a community-based client. We have done something for um, Over the Right Community Housing where we did like a 13-unit building and the students uh, measured the building up, came up with design schematics, actually took it all the way through design development, was able to get significant historic tax credits thrown at that particular building by making professional presentations at the state, all that kind of thing. So it's a little different thing than what that, uh, that, that UC has, their hallmark, the co-op program, significant program, um, that this is something in which the students kind of drive the project under professional guidance, take it through design development, and uh, cost breakdowns and all the rest. In the fall program, it's open to all majors. It's not just an architecture program. It is, uh, right now, there are 16 students living there. Just last night, we had our family orientation move-in day, and they're in their orientation right now. But we have people from family studies, social work, geography, sociology, architecture, teachers. Student teachers are actually working full-time in Rotenburg and Taft High School. And they live in the community and they take courses down there. Um, <clears throat> something about the intention. We're not trying to be a charity model. Um, we're trying to assist the underserved. I've learned from someone like Peter Block, sometimes the language of help is just not very helpful. And uh, I, I love that phrase. And it's about trying to walk with, learn from. It's not trying to uh, go and help anybody. I have a, I'll have a... 
um, a caption or a, a saying here in a minute that kind of shows this. This begins to talk about our practices. We involve ourselves in community assistance work, advocacy work, design build work, and agitprop work. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a second. But these are the challenges that are put on us, John and I, all the people that teach in the program, as well as the students. And these come from, this is that saying, if you come to help me, don't waste your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. The motto at the Peasley Neighborhood Center is really kind of cool. Expression is the first step out of oppression. And on one hand, that means, yes, express yourself as a human agent, meaning-making agent in the world, express yourself, and you become more human. Uh, that's a part of it, a deep part of it. But there's another part of it that they talk about, is that expression, when it's tied to an analysis of oppression, that becomes the liberating experience. Expression, when it's tied and coming out of an analysis of oppression, what these students feel or young, young people feel at, uh, at uh, Beasley, that becomes a liberating practice. This is one that we've heard again. Seek out those most vulnerable and most oppressed so that you may learn how to live. Now that's, a, that's pretty challenging. That's, that's, uh, that basically is trying to say to students, by walking with us, learning from us, you know, build relationships with us, then trust develops. And it's at this point that students change. Uh, they change deeply by the relationships that they build with community people. And some of these things are still, some of these relationships and friendships that they make with people down there. Students will say to you that Over the Rhine is the friendliest, friendliest environment that they've ever lived in. The friendliest environment. The, they learn who the current residents on the streets are. And they know about Miami students coming down. We're now in our eighth year of, of doing this. So we involve ourselves in community assistance. People might work at Roten, Rotenberg, like I said, or they might work in any of the kinds of people's movement organizations to serve deep need. We've done a lot of design build work back from 90, 96 up to now. Here's just a quick smattering. I wanted to show you just one quick project. This was a very fun project that John and I worked on. We you begin to see that there is this uh, two by four wall. We began to realize we didn't need it. Let's take it out. And we also, um, there, wasn't, there was basically a wall that was going up the side of that stairwell. And uh, students, you just let students go, you know. You let them go, they got to figure out a budget, and this is what they came up with. Um, I want to give a shout out to UC, uh, Frank Russell, um, director of the Niehoff Community Design Studio, and Terry Bowling. Um, this is Venice on Vine, you might recognize. Uh, that was a joint project between UC and us. This is actually the UC component of the, of the building. We, uh, we worked in the administration office mostly. But Miami students were one of the first groups in there. We did a lot of the demolition and a lot of the initial framing. But uh, the brickwork and the woodwork and uh, the signage and stuff like that was Terry Bowling students. Um, give you an idea about what agitprop is. I mean, basically think of these as sort of artistic installations. Uh, some are interior, some are exterior. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, design shirts and go down onto Fountain Square and try and have uh, an informational protest, like try and share with people, like homelessness is not a crime, and talk with people on Fountain Square. Um, there's a lot of these that we could talk about. I want to mention um, this one. This is actually our center, and this was a few years ago, and, um, and this is the inside. And this particular man, whoop, go back. This guy right there, or Tom. That person right there, David Rosenthal. David Rosenthal is a photographer and was teaching at this School for the Creative and Performing Arts. And one of the things he wanted to do was have the students move out into the environment, take pictures, write poetry, and so forth. They made a conscious effort to reach out to the men in the men's recovery program of the drop-in center. Now, in an era, or perhaps in that tone of like, oh my God, we have a school right next to a drop-in center. What are we going to do? Well, David, you know, kind of like took students over to the drop-in center, met with the men over there, and they did this every Thursday for a semester. And then architecture students um, designed sort of an infrastructure, a whole new kind of infrastructure to house an exhibit. And then we had a big open house. 
there was not a dry eye in the place. When the students started to talk about what they learned about homelessness and began to see these people as people, right, not just as a statistic or a stereotype. And then at the same time, um, the men, the men were crying. They're talking about how they were impacted by their time with them and how they wrote poetry together and things like that. I mean, that's what you could do. That's, that's the exciting thing about, uh, about bringing people together and actually having terms like mixed income or economic mix actually mean something. Um, this is the fourth narrative, though. This is the one that worries me, and I pose it as a question. I'm not, so sh not sure yet exactly if it's happening, but this is a book. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Alice Skirts. Alice Skirts is a social worker who has lived most of her life in Cincinnati and, and in over the Rhine area. This is a book that was published about a year ago and it by the National Association of Social Workers Press. And she has coined this term called econocide, elimination of the urban poor. And this is the fear that a lot of people that are current residents in over the Rhine have. Um, are we going to be able to be a part of the mix? Are we going to be able to be a part of the new development and the new experiences that are beginning to emerge in Over the Rhine? And in this book, um, it's all about Cincinnati and primarily about Over the Rhine, and it's very empirical. It's not a glossy platitudinal override. It really actually goes through legislation after legislation after ordinance after ordinance after ordinance. It's really quite devastating and exhausting to read this book, but it's a, it's a good book to take on. What I find interesting, it caused me to start thinking about other scholars in the world. I'm an academic, so I, got, I play that game too, as well as community engagement. You know, and um, <clears throat> the top quote is Alice's, like genocide, so econocide, the disposal of economic others, the exclusion of victims from the universe of obligation. We don't have an obligation to them anymore. They're just fend for themselves in the market, and wherever they go, they may go. Um, you might have heard of some of these people, uh, Slavoj Žižek, social apartheid. I, these are um, different terms, empathetic collapse, social apartheid, econocide. There is a person, Ajun Apatari, who actually uses the term econocide, a worldwide tendency to arrange the disappearance of the losers in the great drama of globalization, or social apartheid, the relationship between the included and excluded is the most crucial one today. State perceives the excluded as a threat and worries how to keep them at a proper distance. Now, that's kind of the academic side of things and like scholars who are writing on ur urban conditions worldwide, but you know, I begin to wonder, is this in a sense beginning to happen in a place like over the right? But check this out. How many have seen Elysium? Have you seen Elysium? Couple, couple. How many have seen District 9? Yes. District 9. They're the same filmmaker. District 9, I think, came out in 2009. It was up for Academy Award, you know, Best Picture, and I think three other Academy Award nominations. This is probably not going to make it into the Academy category, but uh, if, if you saw it. But the, the, the visuals and the premises of these movies are really quite amazing. Elysium, if you know anything about this movie, is that Matt Damon's on Earth, and you can see the space station up there. That's where all the elite live. And it's uh, 2,154, and the elite have moved themselves to what we might call a gated satellite community. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, people are trying to get up there because that's where the health care is. But this is a story. Yeah, I find it interesting that this is in the cinema. This is mass market movies that are dealing with inequality, access to health care, maybe immigration questions, things like that. District 9 is even more poignant. The story here, you see the spaceship, it stalls out over Johannesburg. It takes place about 20, 30 years ago, something like that. And it stalls out. No one knows what to do with it. People, they land on it. The army lands on it. They break in. They find thousands of emaciated aliens. Now, I mean, most alien movies, right, are about what are they going to do to us. Now it's what are we going to do to them. This story is about a multinational corporation wanting to have that territory of District 9, so they have to round up all these aliens and move them to a new and approved District 9. Now, I think that's, about, that's a statement about black people. I think it's a statement about homeless people. I think that's a statement about immigrant people, um, things like that. And you kind of wonder if um, what's really going on is removal, all at a time when everybody talks about inclusion. 
And I'm just throwing it out as there's a tension there that needs to be kind of unpacked and looked at. Uh, and with this slide, this is perhaps one of our motivating principles. Um, it's a paraphrase from Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire was um, probably the world's most renowned educator in the world, but hardly known in the United States. He died in the late 90s. He wrote a lot of books. The most famous one is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. This is from his book called Pedagogy of the City. His project was literacy. He would work with peasant populations and he wanted to he understand their cultures and so forth and would work with peasant populations. And he says, as people start to read the word, people start to read the world. And there's kind of a political consciousness that begins to develop. So it is one thing to implement an urban development campaign. He would have the word literacy. Urban development campaign in a society in which the subordinate classes begin to take their history into their own hands with enthusiasm, with hope. And another to put into practice urban development campaigns in societies in which the subordinate classes find themselves removed from the possibility of exercising a greater participation of trans transformation of their society. So that concludes my uh, presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions or there's you know, some controversy here and I'm sure there's people with contrary opinions. That, that's great. That's the purpose of this as far as I can tell. So thank you for your time. So. <laughs> Thank you.